break into we will break into small groups after we discuss those a bit and we'll come back together and share our experiences of conversing and then we've got a brief video about the intersection of racism and climate change, a very important issue. From there, we'll have about 15, 20 minutes on ways we can each get engaged. Some of us are already very engaged in action on climate change. And maybe there's one more thing you'll get an idea about, or you might have some ideas to suggest to others. It's a pretty exciting range of possibilities. Everything from just working on your own carbon footprint to um, endorsing things such as the emergency declaration tomorrow. And we'll now move to climate change in a nutshell. Dwayne Ediger is a member of the board of Sustainable Tucson. He is a solar panel expert. He installs them on people's homes. He knows how to figure out solar budgets. He's uh, great with a spreadsheet and uh, has got his feet on the ground at the same time. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Dwayne. Thank you. Uh, I will share my screen. All right, it's great to be in a room of, I believe it's for some 24 people here. It's a little hard to imagine, but we have to remember what that's like to be in a room together. And I uh, encourage you to look at the faces of those who, are, who have a video and uh, remember that there are many more people here and give thanks for that. Um, we're living in a moment of national and worldwide possibility and gloom. We're gathered tonight to point to the possibility of a stabilized and sustainable climate, to learn to talk better about it and to act on it. As a kid growing up in the Denver area in the 60s, I had every reason to expect that the butterflies, the birds, the bugs that enjoyed our yard every bit as much as I did would be as happy and plentiful half a century later as they were then. Oh, let's try that. I'm not getting the next slide. Oh boy. All right, let's try that again. Just a moment. Dwayne, you could try the arrows. I'm not sure if that would help. I think I ended screen share and I have to find my way back in. Okay. So. Um, yes, they say if you're going to a Zoom meeting, expect glitches and then don't be surprised. So here's our glitch for the evening. Here right, we go. Let's see if this works. I should be seeing a brown cloud and it's not happening. Oh boy. Ah. All right, how about this? Let's try sharing another screen here. You're gonna see it with the junk around it, but that seems to be the only way. Ah, it's because I was using the last one. Now oh, let's try this. Oh! All right. As a kid growing up in Denver in the 60s, I had a reason to expect those butterflies and birds to be able to enjoy at things 50 years later as much as they did and I did then. But it didn't take long for threats to come into view, including pesticides, Denver's noxious brown cloud of smog or nuclear war to cast a doubt on our shared future. Yet, the first Earth Day and other movements of the time beat back the brown cloud on the foothills of the Rockies and kept threats of nuclear war and pesticide poisoning at bay for quite a good while. In Tucson, most of us have just survived our city's hottest ever months, July and August. Last Friday, we broke the all-time high September temperature record, not just by one degree, but by three degrees Fahrenheit. I don't have time to present to you a detailed explanation of how human-caused greenhouse gas emissions, mostly carbon dioxide and methane, are the main cause of the rapid and extreme changes in Earth's climate. The documentation is extensive, as the scientific consensus. The biggest contributors are first, burning fossil fuels for energy, and second, burning fossil fuels for transportation, and third, agriculture, mainly cattle and beef. The Paris Agreement 
since 1992, excuse me, the Paris Agreement is the culmination of a movement since 1992 in the United Nations to address climate change. In 2015, they met in France and hammered out the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, the clearly stated goal is to limit global temperature rise to a maximum of, to well below two degrees Celsius, and if possible, to keep it to within 1.5 degree Celsius. And this was agreed to by most of the nations of the world, almost all of the nations of the world. Um, and here I have just a little reminder of what we are here for in this struggle. We love life and we are defending it. So figuring out required reductions in greenhouse gas emissions in order to limit warming is done through a carbon budget. You hear the phrase, leave it in the ground, and that's where this comes from, it's a carbon budget. If you come away with, from this talk, this little short five minute talk with only one thing, I want it to be that red number. That red number, 8% reduction every year, represents what it would take worldwide to reach a goal not of one and a half degrees Celsius, which we would like to do, but of 1.65 degrees Celsius. The 1.5 degree uh, target would require every year for us to use 14% less, have 14% less greenhouse gas emissions than we currently have or than the prior year has. And every year that goes by, if we wait one more year to start on that process, that percentage goes up to 15.9%. If we had started three and a half years ago at the beginning of this current presidential administration to reach the 1.5 degree C mark, we would have been able to do so by reducing our emissions by 9.5% every year. That's how close we're getting to this limit. So 1.5 is pretty far out of the range of possibility now. What does 1.5 mean? It means we lose 70 to 90% of coral reefs. If we go to two degrees, we're almost guaranteed to lose almost all of the coral reefs. And this is just one sample. There are of course many other effects that I, can't, I don't have time to go into. All right, so there we are with that. Tomorrow, the city council, as has already been mentioned, will consider a proposal to declare a climate emergency. The mayor and council member Paul Durham are bringing the proposal. And if some of you were here two week, months ago at our meeting, Paul was present for flattening the carbon curve. Uh, regardless of how that decision works out, I hope that the facts presented tonight are persuasive that we in, are indeed in a state of emergency. It's okay for a little while not to know exactly what to do in a state of emergency. It's okay. But doing the inner processing, learning how to communicate about it are a lot better than being unwilling to face the challenge, which is, I think, what a lot of us can get stuck in with feeling overwhelmed, especially in a time when there's other crises going on. So governmental bodies declaring the emergency is essential, but it is not sufficient, of course. Every person's and every group's creative and collaborative contributions are what will allow us to overcome. I am going to stop sharing for a minute and ask a question, have our past and present prepared us to take on this climate challenge? Um, the pandemic has put us in a place of vulnerability and has disrupted our lives. Um, many of you have lived through other threats, the nuclear war threat in the last century. Somehow the worst outcome of that was avoided and has been to date. Like the nuclear threat, climate is a human caused problem. But unlike it, if we just go on as we are, we're not gonna avoid the worst outcome of the climate crisis. But all is not gloom. What we need to do is pursue the things we want and need. For example, virtual power plants. How many, have, how many, raise your hand if you have heard of a virtual power plant, have an idea what that means. This is basically where a project will happen in a country and solar and battery storage will be in people's homes, in small businesses, and they are on a private property, but they are to an extent controlled by the utility 
such that it benefits not only those homes and the neighborhoods, but also it, it makes the grid able to handle all of that because it's coordinated. These things are happening in Australia. There are pilot programs in the United States. And this is the kind of thing together with uh, microgrids, which I talked uh, two months ago, that we can get excited about and participate in the solutions to our climate crisis. Holding off on climate change isn't the only benefit to decarbonization. Pima County is seeing a rise in health damaging ozone levels on hot days, and this is induced by our fossil fuel emissions. Asthma rates can be brought back down to make Tucson once again a haven for people who have breathing problems. Uh, and we really could use that status, but uh, we don't have it like we used to. In Colorado, the brown cloud is actually coming back. And this time, fracking on the front range of the Rocky Mountains is contributing as much as all vehicle traffic. Our solutions are not easy, but causing the human organized prevention of climate catastrophe is infinitely easier than accepting the conditions of catastrophe and the harms that our inaction would impose on everything and everyone we love. And that is about how much time I was allotted. I am going to stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Duane. Uh, let's take a few minutes. Uh, just raise your hand or unmute if you'd like to ask or comment on what Duane brought out. Duane, uh, how much of the uh, different options of, that are being tried around the world are legal here in Arizona? You mentioned the virtual power plant and microgrids and things There's like no law against it. There is just not a political or uh, organized will to make it happen. I would say that's the case. Yes, there would, be, there would need to be some regulatory approval, but there is not, uh, outside of that, excuse me, outside of that, there's not a law that says we can't do it. I think we may be feeling slightly stunned. It's, there's always another angle to take on this. The disappearance and the reappearance of the brown cloud is, of course, deeply concerning. We've been seeing a lot more of those kinds of clouds here with all of the wildfires this summer. Yes, Bettina, can you unmute? Down at the bottom of your screen, if you press, there's a can little mic. Can you hear me? Now we can. Um, I'm in Montreal. Uh, it's, it's quite a different environment from Tucson. Um, but it, it does indicate what differences can occur when, um, when the administrators care to support uh, moves to a greener environment. For example, our compost is picked up the same way as your recycling is. Our recycling is picked up, but our compost is also. Um, we started a move to uh, avoid plastic bags quite some years ago. Uh, initially, um, people were given a lot of bags and then um, they were paid uh, five cents like Sprouts does in Tucson um, if, they, if they brought their own bag. Um, uh, more recently, they were charged five cents if they wanted to use a plastic bag. They were charged per bag. Um, there is no a problem taking our bags into the stores now. I just came back from shopping and uh, took my cloth bags and that was fine. Um, and a lot of other people do too, but not all. So even with all the supports we have, there still is some lethargy and uh, <clears throat> failure to be concerned uh, when individuals are left, you know, to, to be lazy or unthinking. <laughs> um, 
but it, it helps a great deal when when there's um, some help from the top. So thanks for that sharing. I think also looking at what other countries do and uh, might help. Um, seeing how they got to where they are now, which is not great. <laughs> yeah, but we've all got some steps to take. Thank, thank you, Bettina. I, I know you you live here and in Canada. And we're always glad when you're here. Yeah, me too, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> so, uh, Danye, will you introduce our next part? Yes, uh, thank you, Stuart. So now we're going to dive into the heart of the matter of the workshop tonight. Some specific strategies for us to communicate about climate change more effectively to motivate the action that we need so very much. Um, so just a moment, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, the way this is going to work is we're going to be uh, taking turns. Uh, several people will be presenting. Um, including uh, Dan and Paula and Stuart and myself. So we'll be um, talking about the strategies one at a time. So just a moment here. And Stuart, feel free to remind me of the order because I'm, uh, okay. it's hard to see that while I'm in. That's all right. On the first one, what we are referring to is a booklet put out several years ago called The Psychology of Climate Change Communication by the, I always, there's the Center for Research and Environmental, I think, Decision. It's at Columbia University, and they have done a lot of look at the social science of behavioral change because as Bettina was indicating, you and I may be bicycling to work, our neighbors might be getting solar panels put up, we might all be shifting to a more vegan diet, and yet we are still putting out more carbon through our lives than, than our carbon budget will allow, as Dwayne was saying. What I heard was that we need to get to about 5,000 pounds of climate emitted per person per year by 2030. And we're, <clears throat> there are people living in Africa who are doing that right now. And here in the US, we're a lot closer to 20,000 pounds per year or more. So we all can work more in that direction. At any rate, how do we help other people get excited too? After all, it's no fun uh, leading the charge when there's no one following. So the book from Columbia University, The Psychology of Climate Change Communication, laid out eight principles. And we're gonna talk about those very briefly and then consider them in small groups. So take notes if you like, uh, make mental notes, and then we'll, we'll have um, time to talk about them in our groups. Number and one is called Know Your Audience. Stuart, may I quickly add that uh, I am going to post the links to those documents, the full version of the document and a shorter um, kind of overview in the chat box. Great. So, and at the very back around page 45 or 40, they, they have the eight principles all in a couple of pages. So Know Your Audience. This is about understanding mental models. We don't go in, out into the world just really as blank slates. We've got mental models and, and mental frames whereby we perceive things. That's how we can navigate through the world. So there's nothing wrong with having mental models. There are problems though when our mental models are fallacious or imprecise or incomplete. For instance, some people don't have much in their mental model about, oh, what I do in life has a difference outside of my home. And um, there was a, a great uh, Peter Douglas who helped found the California Coastal Commission, later became the director of it. He said, the two biggest enemies of the environment are ignorance and apathy. And ignorance has to do a lot with imagination. Can you even imagine that when you drive your car, 
there's invisible things coming out of you that are affecting life on our planet. So how do we inspire people to start to think that way? What the Columbia folks say is first try to get to know them a little bit. Uh, otherwise, their, their mindsets will not have any way to really receive what you're trying to share. I'll give an example of someone who uh, I think did an effective job of thinking about people's mental mindsets. His name is Rob Hopkins. He founded the Transition Movement. And he's got a talk he's given quite often. It starts off with uh, a beaker full of petroleum. And he talks about the incredible energy contained in that beaker. And he compares how much weight he could move for a mile and how much energy it would take him to do that and how many calories of food he would have to consume. And then he says, now, let's just try it with gasoline in a car. And it's so much less effort. And so he, he speaks to all of our wish for convenience. He speaks to all of our custom of using motorized vehicles to get things done. He doesn't diss us for that. He doesn't shame us. He just says, this is what we've got. And here are some problems now with what we've got. And that's one of the ways that I find very valuable in speaking to an audience about any issue of environmental improvement or restoration is try to relate to things that they might love already or do already, acknowledge them, embrace them, and then find some way they might think about it differently. And Paula will now introduce the second principle. I know, do you have a slide for me? Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> lovely. So you want to get your audience's attention when you're talking about climate change. And one way to do that is by framing. So what's framing? It's setting the issue within an appropriate context to get the desired interpretation or perspective. You're not trying to deceive or manipulate people but to make credible climate change information more accessible to the people you're talking to. Uh, when people's goals are framed in a manner that feels naturally confident, comfortable to them, they're going to feel better and more positive about achieving those goals, and they're more likely to sustain their behavior in that situation. So you want to consider, for instance, do the people you're talking to belong to any particular group that you want to take into account when you're framing the issue? And the other thing is when framing climate change, you want to be careful not to focus so intently on one particular aspect that the audience loses sight of the bigger picture. We want to always keep coming back to that big, bigger picture, but while you're talking to people, it's often very useful to bring the message close to home. If you can highlight the current and potential impacts of climate change, not just globally, but particularly locally, that will increase your listeners' sense of connection with the issue. So one example for doing that might be to look at local extreme weather events. Those can become teachable moments during which you relate climate change to the experience of the people you're talking to. And we've all seen, I, we are in, here in Tucson, for instance, seeing more and more extreme climate events, like the last two months. Um, Phoenix, it would be even stronger. But we also see in the news, for instance, extreme climate events around the country and around the world. Think of the derecho that leveled so much of the crop, so many of the crops in Iowa. The recent hurricanes, the horrifying wildfires in California. I mean, we were upset enough with the Bighorn Fire here looking at the clouds of smoke and the flames every night 
just imagine what it must be like to be living in California where the fires seem to be covering the whole state. So those could be examples and teachable moments to talk about relating climate change to people's experiences. You wanna keep in mind that although climate change can increase the chance that a particular event will occur, it doesn't cause that event to take place. And this is particularly if you're talking, for instance, about hurricanes, are they caused by climate change? Well, maybe they're impacted and affected, maybe made more extreme, but they're not necessarily caused. So that's important to keep that perspective as well. Thank you. I believe I'm next. Is that right? I, Thank you. I believe so. And I'll have a slide up for you in just a moment. <laughs> okay. I know I don't know what it'll look like, but I'm waiting to see. <laughs> All right. My my uh, topic really is about it's the science, or is it? Um, we have all seen the uh, incredible ability of humans to ignore science. <laughs> and maybe we've even experienced that in our own person. Um, and it's kind of sad, but it's also a sign that our communication may be lacking something if all we're doing is saying the facts point to what we have to do and we're not doing it. Um, and that's kind of some, there's, there's some elements, some ways that, that the people who made this report and recommendations have, have put that. For example, uh, some of you may have heard of the Keeling curve, maybe not. It's basically the path of, uh, of carbon emissions, the carbon concentration in the atmosphere and how it goes up at an increasing rate ever since the data has been taken. And it's a very clear, uh, indication of the problem and yet somehow to go from that to engaging people in a decision to uh, that we need to do something to stop climate change is not a direct um, thing that it's not a direct line. So what I tried to do in that five minute presentation was really a kind of a dance between the facts of our situation and the why, why those facts are important part, which is, of course, somewhat subjective, somewhat emotion-based, somewhat humanly intuitive. Um, and that's why I brought the, 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 uh, the sea life picture in there in the middle of some hard to take facts, because sometimes those facts can have the effect of numbing us and stopping our ears from listening because we're overwhelmed. So when we bring ourselves back to our humanity and allow the data and our humanity to mingle together, that's what creates the potential for the data to do something in our person that will be, um, whole, that will be in, into, into, what is the word, holistic and, and put things together. It allows us to put things together. So uh, long and short, if you rely on an emotional message to an excessive degree uh, and the science takes a back seat, that's not necessarily going to be helpful either. Um, it might be in the short term, but it might create active actions that are not based on uh, reality as well. So the best messaging puts together that emotional side and the intellectual side and provides some means for people in their own time to, uh, to get over the overwhelmed feeling that can be so common in, uh, in feeling um, unable to do something in an emergency. I think that is a sufficient sum. There are some examples that they give. Um, I, I will say one other, one other little phenomenon that is cited in the report is called Sorry, I'm not remembering the terminology, but it's basically we have these categories in our head and we say, oh, well, you know, uh, I change my light bulbs, I recycle, and that's my environmental commitment. Um, if we sort of go on an automatic basis with a few actions and say, this is my contribution to the world's ecology, um, 
that doesn't necessarily translate to an appropriate action given what we're seeing at this moment. So um, there, there are ways that one can find to not necessarily critique or you know, say you're not doing enough, but to um, show that there are other, other options around that they might wanna choose once they put their mind and heart together uh, the way that, that, uh, that, when we, that we think best when we can uh, integrate those. I'll end it there, thank you. Duane, what that was principle number four. Am I on the right one? Am I correct? Or you're muted? Three and four. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to go back to number five. Address scientific and climate uncertainties. And I love the question marks because We've got a lot that we know and a lot that is still being explored. Um, and it's important for people to recognize that there are uncertainties, but that doesn't negate the fact that there is a lot of certainty here in the scientific world and in our, in our world as well. Scientists have significant insight on how the climate system functions. They don't necessarily have 100% confidence in their climate change projections, and they never will. What they do is make predictions based on the best available data. They quantify the uncertainties associated with those predictions, and that's the nature of science. Climate science uncertainty might give the sense that scientists are hopelessly confused about this complicated subject, which is a totally mistaken impression. In fact, there really, there's a very high level of confidence that human-made greenhouse gases are warming the planet and are likely to continue doing so. So what you want to do when you're talking to people is put this uncertainty into context and help them understand what scientists know with a high degree of confidence and what they have still some uncertainty about, how, whatever degree that might be. You want to, don't want to overstate the uncertainty and you don't want to work, um, you don't want to confuse people about that because that could easily undermine your message, but you also don't want to ex suggest that there's either more or less scientific certainty than actually exists. So dealing with the uncertainty, but recognizing that it's an important part of the scientific process that is still going on as we learn more and more about the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And I will have our next slide up in just a moment. Okay, and um, Stuart, is this me? I believe it is. <laughs> I'm looking to unmute. How do I unmute? You're, you're uh, unmuted already. Good. Okay, I think you're on. Okay, so for, um, so for this strategy, tap into our social identities and affiliations. Um, people often find themselves in um, torn between their individual needs and desires and those that are for the greater good of the whole, you know, of the world as a whole or the community as a whole. So this is really about trying to strengthen those social identities and affiliations so that um, those ties that we have actually um, help us choose what's better for the greater good 
rather than what we just want for ourselves. Um, and also, you know, to help us find, um, find ways to create things that are good for ourselves as well as everyone else. So that, that is really the strength of this. Um, so the more that we can strengthen those um, group identities that we have, whether it's, you know, as part of a neighborhood or a city or state, um, working together. Thank you, Stuart. I believe you are up for the next one. So let me go to the next slide. I think you're muted, Stuart. You're muted. Let's okay, see. now we go. When I was a graduate student years ago, I was leading an environmental education course for students at the Conservation of Natural Resources Department. And we wonderfully got to take a weekend up in the forest. And boy, I had planned out so many neat things and we were having fun. And Saturday night, people were suddenly not wanting to do the planned activity. And I just didn't get what was the problem. So I finally just said, what's going on? And they said, you didn't ask us what we wanted to do. And, you know, I realized I was the essentially the teacher for the, the whole weekend, and I hadn't considered. Maybe they wanted some time off. I hadn't asked anybody. I imagine you've had an experience like that or seen someone miss the boat that way. What I appreciate is this idea of eliciting, especially the participation of stakeholders before you engage in a plan. And there was a saying that um, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And that, that has been said for many years and it really holds. You can get someone to grudgingly go along for the moment, but will they really adopt? Will they really agree? How different is that from actually coming together and co-creating a solution, co-creating a project? And Shane will be talking about that co-creation at the end tonight. But one thing, I've got two examples, very simple. One is Move Tucson. There's this big effort to improve the, the livability, the the beauty and the flow of our streets. And the city of Tucson decides, you know, we don't really necessarily know all the best things to do. We've got some ideas, we've got some principles, we've got traffic engineers, we've got people who know about bicycles, but we really want to hear from people. So they structured a, a multi-event kind of input of, um, program essentially. Just before the pandemic came, I remember going to the library and standing there looking at, they had um, drawings of the streets and people could put sticky notes or they could uh, write things other places. They were really pulling in from people. Years earlier, when I was working on a plastics uh, project where we wanted to reduce the use of plastic bags and uh, patina, I, I was listening carefully as you were talking about up north. <clears throat> And we had a, a county supervisor who was really strong on this. And he had some nonprofits, including the one I was in, that were very good at advocating and educating and so on. But he said, we've got to get everybody here at the table. The grocers are going to be affected by this. And so they came. And some of them started off by saying, I think this is a terrible idea. And in fact, the man who said that, he ended up being the first grocer to adopt voluntarily a, a no plastic tote bags at the checkout counter anymore policy. And how did he do that? He was included. We listened to him, we took his ideas. There were lots of things we thought would be good and they point out why they wouldn't work. And we were pointing out why we needed to do something. And from all of that came a plan and finally an ordinance in 2011. So that's my pitch for encouraging group participation. It may take a little longer at first, but a lot less pain in the long run. And Danya is going to finish up with number eight.
Number eight, whoops, I'm sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. <laughs> Just a moment. Okay, great. Um, so this uh, principle number eight is about making behavior change easier. <clears throat> it's important to, to know that we are really um, wired to more often than not go with the default option. Um, so, you know, when the default option is to use the plastic bags in the grocery store, more people will choose that. Um, but there are things we can do to work with our psychology. Um, so for example, uh, natural grocers, you know, made the default option that there is no bag. Um, so if we make the default option the more beneficial one, uh, more people will choose that. Uh, we just have to um, put those changes into place and insist upon them. Um, another thing that we can do is to try to provide some immediate incentive, you know, whether it's saving money or um, getting some kind of reward in some way, it actually really helps people make those kind of changes. We are, we are just psychologically wired to want some immediate benefit. We have a hard time with um, thinking of things that are very far away uh, and what benefits they might have. Um, but we're great at appreciating benefits in the short term. So even though we want to encourage people to think long-term and to um, have awareness and appreciate those benefits and of course want to um, preserve our precious planet, we need to also work with people's psychology and make the, make the right thing to do attractive in the moment as well. Let me go. I believe we are to the next point. Uh, just a moment here. We're getting ready for our breakout today. Okay. Um, so this next part, we wanted to give people some time to actually think about these these strategies and what they mean in your own life. So we're going to um, put you in breakout groups of four people per group, three or four, and ask you to answer a couple of questions. But as you answer those couple of questions, which are on the screen now in front of you, um, we'd like for you to follow a certain process that's really about good listening. So Stuart is going to um, briefly talk about that process and then uh, we'll come back and just go over the questions quickly before you go into the breakout rooms. Okay. So we're adding layer upon layer here. One of the underlying principles to all of the strategies which the Center for Research and Environmental Decisions proposes, promotes, an underlying principle is that good listening is fundamental to good communication. So in our breakout rooms, we will practice listening in a way, a specific way, that has a lot of backup in research. I would love to share for an hour about some of that research. I will just tell you that uh, one sample that uh, in a study where teachers learned how to listen reflectively to their students and made that part of their day, the problem behavior in the classroom dropped down about 60% just by that one change. So being a reflective, active, and interested listener is a very powerful intervention. Here's how we'll do that. When you get in your breakout room, first just decide who's gonna be first, second, third, fourth, if there's a fourth person. Doesn't matter, you'll all have equal time. And then whoever's first, oh, by the way, find someone to be the timer because you'll have approximately 15 minutes in your group. So that means 
you know, three or so minutes per person. And you'll, you'll need to hold to it. We don't want to have the first person go for 10 minutes and everybody else gets a minute. So our timekeeper will keep us honest and fair. Anyway, back to once we've decided all that, who's going to be first, et cetera, who's going to be timekeeper, then those two questions, number, is number two up here, or number one, share a situation in which you would like to use one or more of these strategies. It could be at work, it could be at home, could be in school, maybe in your place of worship. And second, you're going to think about what's the most challenging strategy. If you had to pick one that would be hardest for you to apply. So how do, how do we respond when we've heard the person before? So person one says, here's the thing I'm, I really want to do. I want to do more participation with groups. Um, I don't know how to do that. And I want to do it in my, um, my chamber of commerce. And the person could talk for a few minutes, but when they're done, then next person in line, can you reflect back what you heard them to say in one sentence? It won't be everything, but just enough to say, I think I heard you. I think I'm with you. Let me check it out. And a great lead in, it sounds like you're saying, or I think I'm hearing you say, or you are, fill it in. <clears throat> Let your intelligence speak. You did hear them, your intelligence will know what they said. Don't try to say it all, one sentence really can suffice. And then it's your turn. Thank you so much, Stuart, for that introduction. So, um, the point of this is for us to experience uh, well actually the point of this is for us to have a time to actually think about these strategies think about what might be challenging and to brainstorm for ourselves for a moment how we might make that easier and then in the process to have someone really hear us is is very powerful so in just a moment um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now, but well, actually I'm going, to, I'm going to pause just for a minute so you can look at the questions again because you won't see them again. So they're in the chat. Out. They're in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, but actually, I think in the once you're in the breakout rooms, you may not be able to access the chat. I'm not sure. So you can copy it before we go. That's a great idea. Um, so if anyone wants to copy the questions from the chat. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now, <clears throat> give you about 30 seconds to copy it from the chat if you would like. And then in a moment, um, you're going to go into breakout rooms. So you'll see a little uh, window that's going to pop up on the screen and it will say join breakout room number, whatever it will be. Uh, please uh, click on that to join it. And then you will be uh, you will be brought back to the main chat room, the main big room here, um, at the end of that time automatically. So you won't have to do anything else. Okay, so just a moment. Bettina, Bettina, did you have a question? We can't hear you though, so can you unmute? Bettina, you'll need to okay. unmute. Right. Um, is there a quick way? Do I just put command copy? Will that com copy it? Uh, or it Yes, highlight and, and copy. Okay. All right. Hmm. Okay, and give us just a little more time for the copying. And it's basically two questions. Um, the first, in what situation would you like to try using these strategies? And the second one is, what might be most challenging for you and how can you make it easier? Did it work? Did it work for you, Bettina? 
No, uh, uh, I, I highlighted it, put command copy, and I pulled up a um, page from Word and tried to copy it into there, and it didn't go. <laughs> so, uh, I've had that problem. Let's see. If we put it in the chat box now, we can resend. What about a screenshot? Uh, okay, forget how to do that. <laughs> it's a good idea. On, on my computer, at least, there's a button towards the top on the right that says print screen. For a Mac, it'd be command shift four. It's command shift four, I think, yes. Oh, for a screenshot? Command shift four. And then you have to. But then I. Then you have to use your thing to. But I have to highlight it first, right? No, no, it'll give you the starting point. But where the command. Possible to expand the chat window to get more to go four. in there and then you can. Take it. I don't know how to. Okay, no, no. Here. Oh, look at that. And shift this four and let go. And then you. We're all learning technology as we go. It's a. Yeah, my husband is better at this. New reality. Thing. You went down to there? Yeah, no, not to the end. That's only part way down. It, you it can't, you can't, no, no, you can't. You have to take separate pictures of each oh, screen. Oh, okay. There's one, then scroll up and then do it again. Okay. Uh, lesson for all of us. Uh, okay, so if you're on a Mac, yeah. Okay, okay. you got there. Okay. So com I'll just go to Command, Shift, holding both down, touch four, left all three, go. Then your cursor has put it up to the top, say top left of what you want to screenshot of. And as you pull it down and to the right, it will highlight a whole bunch of stuff. And that's what will be in the shot. When you let go your mouse or your keypad, you get the click. And then. So I, I think I'm going to just give a few more seconds so that we won't get too behind on the schedule. Um, just a reminder of the questions. In what situation would you like to practice these communication skills? And second question, what might be most challenging for you and how can you make it easier? Okay, here we go. Stuart, can you hear me? I can. Okay. I'm waiting to see where someone is needed. Um, so far, no one in breakout four has joined. I don't know why. Would that be Fatima and Diana and Debbie, perhaps? Yeah. Okay. Well, they may be off getting a cup of tea. I hope so. Um, I'm just, I think I'm going to hang out and keep an eye on it. If you want to join in with uh, room three where I see you, then feel free to go ahead would and you do like that. Me to go to room three? Well, yeah, that would be nice because right now there's just Jana and Tra Trace. Oh, okay. Here I go. Let's see how I do that. Does, okay, does it, did you get a pop up? Yeah. And okay. of course, we are a little behind time, so I'll, I'll assume you will adjust. Or maybe check in our room and see how we're doing to check on time. Yeah, I, I need to look at the schedule here. <laughs> okay. I'll check that out while you guys are in there.
Hi, Diana and Debbie, can you all hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Is that Diana? That's, yeah, it's me, Diana. Okay, did you get a message on your screen to join a breakout room? I did, uh, but I was uh, working on something else, so I, I didn't join the room. <laughs> oh, okay, that's all right. It's your okay. choice. Uh, Debbie, did you want to join a breakout room? Well, uh, Diana, we'll, we'll be back in large group in, in just a little bit. Not yeah, no problem. Well.
Hi, Donye. <laughs> back. Yeah. Have you talked to Debbie with Donye? No? We can't hear you. We, we see your lips moving, but we can't hear you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I, I believe I, I did try to, to talk with Debbie, but she didn't answer. I think she must have stepped away okay. for a moment. So I'm going to share my screen again. Let me get back to the right, the right spot here. Okay. Um, so. Okay, so we are running a little bit behind time. Um, the plan originally was to have everybody um, think about these two questions and type your answers into the chat box. You are still welcome to do that, um, but we have a little less time than, um, than planned. I, um, Stuart, I believe we're supposed to start um, the next part about 7.25, or is that correct? The, the video would be, it's, it's time for the video because at 7.35, we're going to talk about the actions. Okay, so just quickly, quickly we won't give people um, time to share this, but think about how you felt being listened to well for a change. And think about what aha moments you might have had about the communication strategies. Okay, so you can keep thinking about that as we... Um, move into the video. So um, as we move into the video, what we're really going to be addressing is um, how inequity, racism, and climate change are intertwined. I am so sorry that is not supposed to be there. <laughs> um, so just look at the top part of that. That was something I actually missed when I edited this. Um, so this is really um, looking at the roots of how everything that's happening in the world right now is really related. They are really not separate things that we need to work on in isolation from each other. They are all rooted in the same issues. And knowing that will help us work on all of them more effectively and address climate change more effectively. So give me just a moment and let me uh, share the video with you. Bring it up and then reshare. This is definitely a, a learning curve. <laughs> Danielle, if you like, I can read the climate change, I mean, sorry, the equity statement from Sustainable Tucson, if you'd like, while you're working on Sure, it. sure. So this was, um, set a few months ago, a little prologue that a few years ago I heard a, um, someone had written a book about cotton and talked about how incredibly important cotton was to building the wealth that this country has. And of course, who were the people who were picking the cotton? Were the uh, pe persons who were enslaved at the time? And began to point out just how deeply that what our country is has depended on some really terrible beliefs and policies and practices. And we're still really getting ourselves out from under all of that. So Sustainable Tucson unequivocally condemns the systemic racism that pervades our nation, shown all too clearly by the recent murder of George Floyd and the steadily growing number of people of color whose deaths at the hand of police we continue to grieve. We cannot have a truly sustainable and resilient society without equity and justice for all members of that society. To that end, we see the fight for justice, climate and environmental justice as much as any other form of social justice as an integral part of our climate and environmental activism. And now it's passed by the board a few months ago. Thank you, Stuart. Um, and I was trying to fast forward through the ads. I don't know if you guys could hear that while you were speaking, Stuart, but I, I didn't quite get through the ads, but I will, I will get through them as quickly as possible. 
Um, While you're doing that, Dan made a, there's lots of nice comments been made. Dan said it can be very hard to give up the myths we hold dear, but true understanding is much more powerful and the first step to being truly free. Thank you, Stuart. Um, okay, so now we're going to um, continue and uh, there will be an ad for just a moment. I apologize for that. The, the theme of this is really um, um, voting to fight environmental racism. If we cast a ballot, it will be to vote him out. Voting won't solve everything, but it's definitely something you can do to affect change. Pledge to vote for Joe Biden. How serious is this climate crisis? It's literally deadly. Like, if we don't do something about it within the next 10 years, we won't have a home to live on. Environmental racism is the disproportionate impact of environmental hazards on people of color. It's not a coincidence that factories, highways, and other major polluters are located in the communities that they are, leading certain people much more likely to breathe polluted air. The Mott Haven neighborhood of the Bronx, for example, just over the bridge from where we're shooting, has some of the worst air quality in the country. The population, 97% black or Hispanic. 22-year-old Daphne Frias is a New York native and student activist known for mobilizing hundreds of people for the March for Our Lives movement and Zero Hour who promote climate and environmental justice. The racist tendencies behind the climate crisis is something that I've personally experienced and a huge reason why I got into this movement. Growing up in West Harlem, I saw how urban planning and city planning was disproportionately targeted towards black and brown communities with climate destroying infrastructures like uh, where I live there's a huge bus depot which is the largest bus depot for the MTA in Manhattan there's a water treatment plant and there's also a huge on-ramp to the highway here in New York City and if you're having cars constantly coming off the highway you're going to have huge levels of exhaust that's going to be polluting our air quality and these are things that you often don't see in more affluent communities and it begs the question why is that happening? Just because you're poor and you're a community of color doesn't mean that you don't deserve a good quality of life. If we're not talking about environmental racism, when we talk about the climate crisis, we're really not addressing the climate crisis at all. When you think about justice, right, environmental justice, what is that and what does it look like? A lot of times we talk about um, going plastic free or going vegan, all of those are great and important if you can do so. But if you're in a low income family and you're living in a food desert where the only options for you are maybe one supermarket and fast food chains, you're not going to be going vegan. You're not going to be worrying about how do I get tote bags and how do I make sure that my groceries aren't in plastic bags. Like That's not your concern. So how do we adjust our measures to meet every standard of living within our country? That's how we achieve environmental justice. Unfortunately, the climate crisis is tied economically to our capitalist society and the way that our money moves throughout our country. And if we're passing legislation that affects the money flow of America, everybody immediately puts up warning signs and says, hey, that makes us feel uncomfortable. Why is that going on? Um, and my response to that was like, well, I think we should all have a planet to live on and have nice air to breathe and have good food to eat and clean water. Like, I don't think those should be mutually exclusive situations. Uh, I'd much rather have a planet to live on than money in my pockets, because if I don't have a planet to live on, what money am I going to be spending? And I think that's why a lot of young activists, when we're talking about legislation, we want to pass legislation that is firmly uh, creating patterns of divestment to the fossil fuel industries, because they are the ones who control uh, sort of the capitalist sector of what is the climate crisis. And if we're not divesting money from them and putting it into community resources that can help heal our earth, 
we're not going to make any progress towards having a cleaner and safer healthier earth. Mark Chambers is New York City's Director of Sustainability. He's tasked with overseeing the entirety of the five boroughs and implementing ways to reverse human-induced climate change. <laughs> Just to reiterate, yeah. that plastic, if left untouched, will be there for a hundred years. Yeah, absolutely. Yo, that's crazy. So it depends on the types of plastic, but for the most part, yeah, and and some some cases even longer. It all depends on the types of plastic. And I, but it, it's the point is that plastic breaks down; it doesn't disappear. So it may look a little bit different than it does right now, but it will always be here with us. And so we have to be able to do better and come up with different products and different materials that we already have in abundance that can do the same job. But they're not gonna. The problem is that. We are tied to petroleum, tied to fossil fuels. That's what goes into those plastics. So they have an invested interest in us to keep using them. And we have to change that. And we have to bring all of our kind of collective energy to bear to make sure that we're forcing them to give, to give us something different. Basically though, it's all about the dollar. That's what you say. It's all about the dollar. And it's all about how much fossil fuel companies have integrated themselves into our lives and how we have to break that reliance. Think about it like this. There are a lot of systems that, that support us living our lives. It's not just about individual responsibility. There's something, there's a, a narrative that says that if everyone you know, changes their behavior and that they are the only, that's the only thing that's gonna impact climate change. It's not that. It's that it, to a certain extent, but we need aggressive federal leadership in order to actually change some of the, the big systems that help us to be able to live better lives and ones that are not uh, draining all the resources of the planet in order for us to, to maintain the status quo. The presidential election is just a few months away. For many, it's one of the most important elections in our country's history, with tensions extremely high. If we do not take action at the polls that lead to systemic change, our Earth will continue to trend negatively. Climate change is real. Uh, those that do not believe it's real are in dereliction of their duty and need to be replaced by people that do. There is a, a role that we all have to play in being able to make sure that we are growing the tent of people that are relying on facts and science to be able to uh, meet the challenge. And that requires there to be adults in the room that need to be able to act with the urgency and the sophistication that's necessary. Uh, we don't have the time to waste because we do not have the time for that. Is it important for us to hit the polls with climate in mind? It's incredibly important for uh, everyone to do the research to, to, to make sure that you understand the facts. And the facts are that our, our world is changing, our climate is changing rapidly. I want to say first and foremost for the Gen Z vote, if you don't have a strong climate plan, whether it be for a senator, for a congressman, for assembly, and for president, Gen Z is not going to be voting for you. So this election for many will be the first presidential election that they're able to take part in. Um, one, just can you kind of speak to the importance of that? And two, for those who are maybe undecided or, or, or are seeking more information, uh, where would you direct them to go? So the best way to be a climate conscious voter at the polls is to see where your politician is accepting money from. A quick search of the politician's name and sort of payroll will publicly reveal where their money's coming from. It's a, it's a law that they have to disclose these things. And if you see, uh, oil companies on the top of those lists. If you see um, travel companies on the top of those lists, they're definitely accepting money from fossil fuel industries. The best thing to do is maintain pressure and constant communication with them. You can write letters, you can make phone calls and ask them, well, I, I remember you saying that you were gonna pass, you know, blank specific bill when you were campaigning. What is the progress on that bill? Are you still gonna pass that bill? It's 
It's about creating the habit to vote in every single election, not just in a presidential year. Vote for your school board, vote for your mayor, vote for your assemblyman, vote for your governor. Any vote that's out there, vote for it. Because every layer of legislation and every layer of uh, governing bodies out there creates sort of a cake that represents our governmental system in this country. Also, remember to fill out your absentee ballots because you never know if you're going to be off at college or vacationing with your friends or just simply away from the polls whenever the elections might happen. Even if you end up being home, it's still really important to have a backup and have a way for your ballot to get heard and casted. It's not even just voting, which I think is relevant, but you know, everyone also needs to, I think everyone needs to fill out the census as well. So if they go to you know, my2020census.gov, it takes less than 10 minutes. But that determines how we get funding. And that funding determines who has the power to be able to push the policies that really confront and meet uh, the challenge that we're facing. And, it's, and that is going to be one of the big determinants of whether or not we're able to do what we need to do. Um, because otherwise, we can all pretend like there are different sides to this, but there, but there aren't. Climate change is real, it's happening now, and if we don't confront it with everything we have, then we are going to see more death and destruction, and that is not an acceptable outcome, especially considering that it's not equally born across all of our, uh, our population. There are black and brown communities all across the country that are on the front lines of a changing climate, and we owe it to them, and we owe it to all of us to be able to meet this moment with aggressive action. There's no room on the sidelines. Hey, Ara, the music is, I like the music at the end of that. Uh, we had originally planned to ask people after this to then get in pairs and talk about how would you explain environmental racism to someone. Uh, because we're a little behind on schedule, we're not gonna do that, but please just think about that. And I, I really uh, appreciate uh, how the, they describe that in the video. Um, our next part is um, the section where we go into action. So let me um, bring up the uh, Google Slides presentation again. Um, just a moment. Thank you for your patience. We have about eight or nine actions we'll very briefly touch on. And we've got the document accessible for all. So for this part, we um, we really um, planned this as a takeaway gift for you. Um, something that you can have access to later, as Stuart mentioned, and that you can draw on as a resource. OK, so Danye is going to talk about first action. Um, I wanted to put this first because it's something that is personally really important to me and I feel that it really is the foundation for everything else we do. Um, we need to create support for ourselves. Find the people in our lives who we can create that kind of support with and, and do it ongoingly. Um, I like to call this a resilience circle. Some people call it a sanity circle. Um, other people might have other names for it. Um, it doesn't matter what you call it, and there can be different forms of it, but the main point is create support so that we can inspire each other, uh, help us help each other work through the little glitches and roadblocks that come up that get in the way as we're trying to make changes. And just generally avoid getting burned out. Um, you know, it's, it's really challenging, and especially with the pandemic and everything that is happening um, around racism in our country. There's a lot on our minds and hearts and we are not meant to go this alone. We need each other. 
Um, so I think that is what's going to give us the energy and uh, to be able to keep our joy in the process. Okay, the second action I would recommend is find a group to join. Sustainable Tucson is one of those groups and your presence here means a lot. We also like to highlight there's a citizens climate lobby. You may know their, their intent, which is to have a carbon fee and a dividend bill passed at the federal level so that we can put the very powerful force of the market to bear on the purchase of fossil fuels. Climate reality, um, Jana, Don, Donye, and Duane have all gone through trainings with the Climate Reality Project. There is a Tucson chapter. Sierra Club is a tried and true organization. It's, it's worldwide, but we've got a local chapter, chapter here called the Rincon Chapter, or sorry, the Rincon Group. It's the Grand Canyon Chapter. And Sustainable Tucson, we now have three committees. Uh, one of them chaired by Danielle Corbett. It's on going out to charitable and faith-based organizations to encourage them to look at greening up their, their property a bit. And uh, there's another group that Robin Moser is chairing called the Habitat Restoration and then Sharia Desjardins working on plastic waste reduction. So we'd love to have you join us in any of these. Um, let me um, just briefly say we we had some different um, we had a debate about the best way to present this information. So we really actually are taking this straight from the resource document. And I know it's a lot of text to to kind of have it in front of you, but we just wanted you to understand that it's a rich resource. And we hope that you will refer back to it, even if you're not able to absorb it all right now. <clears throat> so action number three. So crucially important, help to get out the vote somehow. If you can, you know, join a phone bank, help register people to vote. If you have the time to do those things, please, we need you. Um, if you don't have time to do something that big, talk to people you know. Find out if they're planning to vote, to vote and try to convince them that they need to vote if they're on the fence about it. There, and there's more information here you can um, come back to later. Wayne, would you like to um, give one last pitch for the climate emergency declaration tomorrow? Sorry, did you say my name? Yes, would you like to pitch the climate emergency declaration? Well, uh, yes, I um, the Sustainable Tucson has, as it was mentioned earlier, come out in support of this uh, being adopted, the calling, calling it an emergency as it is. And um, we want to support the city, which if it uh, does this and acts as it should, is sure to get pushback from the state and from lots of people. So uh, they need to know that we support that and there are ways to do that. Being, you can be present for the meeting uh, in much similar fashion that we're present here tonight. I'm not sure if Zoom is their platform or not, but uh, you can participate that way. You can send in a letter of support, uh, I believe, anytime before the meeting, and uh, hopefully it will be received well. And I believe that we're going to be adding in a, a resource link here that we didn't have in quite yet. We will try. I found that the city's website is not one of the most um, nimble websites that I've experienced. And okay. so it may or may not. not get what I wanted for us, so. Uh, Donia, do you wanna talk about number five? Yes, so the next action is move your money out of fossil fuels. Um, and not only being aware of when we make purchases, but uh, where we invest our money. Um, if you have investments, learn about alternatives to corporate banking and, and how to invest in our future rather than in our destruction. A quick note on that. If you go, I know that's the Marin County 
URL there, but if they've, they've got a, a wide net and they've, they've got information that can help you see whether your bank is in fact one of your fossil fuel supporters or if they're invested in, in cleaner um, technologies and things like that. Action number six, um, there's the Thrive Resolution. The Sierra Club is, is a big part of that. So again, go to the document. We'll give you the URL. So I don't expect anyone to copy that now. But this would be a great thing to encourage our electeds to adopt. And Do we have access to this uh, link? Obviously, we can't get it on the screen now. Right. We're going to send you the URL for the entire document that has all of these. I see. Yes. The, the document is called Into Action, and we'll put that at the end. I'll put that in the, the chat now, in fact. That'll be the easiest way. And um, I just want to say that I actually watched the um, the online launch uh, for this um, for the Thrive Resolution and found it immensely exciting. Um, I, I really can't say enough about, um, I can't encourage you enough to uh, check it out and quickly because um, our legislators need to be hearing from us about this right now. Um, I, I'm not sure of the exact date, if it's already been um, introduced or about to be, but it's very soon from now. And it really does uh, work on the intersection of climate, racial, and economic justice. I'd like to thank Danielle for including how to uh, send a letter of support for the emergency resolution. That's great, in the chat box. And while we're acknowledging, I'd like to thank uh, Jenna for inspiring uh, three committees or helping um, catalyze three committees to come together, each of those that I mentioned, the Zero Plastic Waste, Habitat Restoration, and the Charitable and Faith-Based Committees. And they're running on their own steam now, which is, of course, what we like to see, um, giving leadership away and working together at the same time. So action seven, speaking of Jana, she has a really nice um, blog that, with articles about how to live sustainably here in Tucson. And Donya put that there. She's got some ideas about how we can decrease our own carbon footprints. It is possible. Even those of us who are all trying right now, we can do even more. And I'm done with that. And action number eight um, is really um, keep educating ourselves. Continue that process, even when we feel like we know a lot. <laughs> um, keep keep learning and keep advocating. There is a lot to learn about social justice issues and their intersection with environmental destruction, and that includes, you know, our own local communities um, in the city of Tucson and in the state of Arizona in general, and and then just really work to support um, support the efforts that um, groups are doing to address those injustices. And you might consider um, connecting with an organization that honors indigenous wisdom and is working towards environmental justice. And we put a couple of organizations here, the Pachamama Alliance and the uh, Bioneers organization. And so, now I'd like to invite Shane Reiser to tell us about Tucson for the world. Shane is a, a creative, impresario and uh, an encourager of people to think outside the box. Shane, it, um, there you go. Hey, Stuart. Thanks, everybody. Hello again. Can you can uh, you up your mic a little bit? <clears throat> Shane, do you do you have any visuals to share, or should I continue? I can maybe talk with louder. No, you can leave that up there. I'll just talk. Is that cool? Yeah, that's cool. Am I coming? Okay, I sound good. Yeah, do I sound good now? Yeah, okay, that's cool. All right, so uh, for those of you, if you haven't heard about Tucson for the World yet, our plan, our goal is to create a place where Tucsonans come together to create and launch new projects. So it's the place to take action, right? Sustainable Tucson is the place to learn and to talk 
about issues. And then when you have an idea to launch something, whether it's a, just a project that's loose and temporary or a permanent organization that's nonprofit or for-profit, this is an environment where you can uh, come together with other community members and, and launch something. So we get together once a month. We use the same theme that uh, Sustainable Tucson uses. And uh, you can bring an idea, you can pitch it and potentially uh, partner with others that show up, form a team, or you can, okay, am I back? Sorry, said I went out. Or you can um, just show up and join somebody else's team, right? So you can pitch an idea if you want to, or you can join somebody else's team. And uh, we, the whole, the whole purpose is by the end of the experience that we actually create a prototype of whatever it is and it's built and we, we launch it. And it's probably gonna be very simple, but the idea is, to, is that you know, there's many ways to learn things and one way is through doing, right? So experiential learning. So it's a different way to try stuff, to learn new things. The projects may not go anywhere. We hope that some of them will, um, but it's really about building connections and trying stuff and learning things in a new way. And hopefully uh, some of these projects continue and this event is a way to start building momentum. Um, that's really it. Uh, we, uh, you know, we do a quick workshop on how to, how to do prototyping. So you don't have to have any background in what a prototype is or how to build it. It's very simple. We just kind of figure out what's the simplest way to build the smallest version of your idea. You frame it out, sketch it, build it, launch it. Uh, we, this is our second time doing it. We did it once last month and, um, you know, we're always changing the format and learning, but, uh, this, like I, like I said earlier, we do it using the theme of sustainable Tucson. So this week is all about climate change and we're trying to encourage ideas that, um, can either help educate more people on climate change, or even better, if you are if you have some idea to get people to take action, get more people to take action, either change their lifestyles, take action in their personal lives, in their homes, whatever, anything is welcome that, that solves that problem. So we invite you to come out. You can uh, find us on meetup.com slash Tucson for the world. I think I'll just, uh, yep, somebody already, Dan put the link in the, the Zoom chat. So thanks guys, I appreciate it. Oh, and Jana put, all the information about it, you need to know right there. All right. Wonderful. You guys Thank are so you. helpful. Thank you very much, Shane. I really appreciate it. So um, we're just going to take a few minutes to wrap up. Um, so tonight we have, we've been reminded of how urgent our situation is. Um, and we've looked at some strategies for communicating with um, individuals and groups more effectively. And we've looked at some action strategies that we can take, including this great creative opportunity with Tucson for the world. So, um, you know, think about uh, what are your ideas about how we can move beyond this bubble of people who are aware and working to make change? How can we move beyond that to reach uh, people on a large scale, the way we need to, to motivate the large scale change that we need. We need people working together to think about how to make that shift. And that's where you come in, where your ideas are so valuable um, and you have the opportunity to work with others to bring your ideas into, into being, make it happen. So, um, Coming back, we have one more slide. So here are some of our uh, key takeaways. And let me just say um, that Shane will also be available for a few minutes after if you wanted to talk with him. So our key takeaways from tonight are really that we must work together. Um, we, it's, it is so important for us to take individual actions, but it's not enough by itself we have to take collective action. And effective communication to reach more people will motivate that action. 
and also enable us to work together effectively once we do come together, which is also another big piece. So um, with that, I'm going to like uh, stop sharing and see if anyone has any comments during our last few minutes. I just want to invite everybody to Sustainable Tucson's Facebook pages. Um, we have an organizational page that has our cool logo that Sharia created. And um, also we have a community conversation that's quite um, quite active that uh, people like post a lot and they have debates and, and conversations. So you don't have to feel like you're alone. Just join us there on Facebook. Good reminder, Jenna. We are, we are not alone, even though we um, are in our homes a lot right now. We are so not alone. I just wanted to say something. I don't, uh, am I interrupting? No. Um, I might be the only person that no one else recognizes, but I'm so glad I tuned in and uh, I hope to, uh, especially the uh, Tucson for the World Project. Wow, that's exciting. So. Uh, yeah, I'm so, I'm so glad that I tuned in tonight. Welcome, Keith. Thank you. We're so glad you came. But <clears throat> Shane, I think you're saying something, but you're muted. Did you want to try again? There you go. No, and someone was just trying to talk to me from across the room. Oh, got it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know your technology. Well, any any last comments or questions or just a reminder that the contact information for uh, the leaders of the committees is also in the right hand column in the chat, and so if you want to, Danielle's on here tonight, um, but um, you just get her at Daniel Danielle at sustainabletucson.org or any, any of the core team members um, like Trace or Stuart um, or Dwayne, you can get them by just putting their name at sustainableliving.org. That's sustainable Tucson. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I have one more thing I'd like to say regarding the city's work on climate. Uh, the city has a history of doing extensive study and not building implementation of significant work. Uh, I would like for us to have that in mind as we not only encourage the city for taking this word action, but uh, encouraging it to really put teeth behind it with uh, benchmarks for um, measurable emission reductions and uh, not just measurable, but meaningful and significant. Uh, and it will hurt them to do it well. And we have to support, we have to really show that You've got to do this hard because it's a lot that has to happen and we can't just do it in word only. Yes, Fatima Luna is the, um, I've, I'm, I'm afraid I can't recall her exact title, but she's kind of the sustainability rep for the mayor's office. She, I believe that was the Fatima who was attending for the big part of this evening. And uh, she'll be someone that we all should think, keep in mind when we want to communicate with mayor and council about these initiatives. You may not know that the mayor and council or someone in the city declared that we needed an urban forest manager and that job was announced a couple of weeks ago. Actually, Danielle was the one who spotted that. So soon we should have that going for the Million Trees campaign. There are lots of things that, that are rolling out and just what Duane said is exactly uh, appropriate. We need to keep helping things roll forward and be part of that. Yep, and I'd like just like to piggyback on that. I think that with this mayor and council that they do recognize that these steps need to be taken and they are probably the best that we've had for taking action. But yeah, they are going to need support. It's not going to be easy because there's a lot of people there trying to keep happy in Tucson and things that they're going to do to take serious uh, measures on climate change are definitely going to make other people upset. So, you know, we've got to support them 
at the same time, we're pushing them. I agree, we need to push them to continue to take action, but we also need to support them when they do that. And it's really important that they know that people do care about what they're doing. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's get rest, let's get resilient, let's get going, and let's get some good things done. Good night, go in peace and strength. Thank you, Dwayne. And Dan, the chat box will be made available to people later on, is that correct? The chat box notes. We just uh, have if you it. save it, I'll go ahead and save it. Uh, and the way that you can copy and paste things or just highlight the whole thing, um, that's by left clicking on your computer and then right clicking, copy will pop up and click on copy and then go put it on a dock somewhere. So. I really appreciate everything that everyone put into the chat box. That's It's a great way for us to share a lot more information during a workshop like this, so thank you. Thanks, thank you for coming and taking a, a, a deep thoughtful dive. Thanks everybody. Thank Good you. night all. Thank coming. you guys. Bye, Thanks, Jana. Good to see you, Danielle. Good to see you, Christina. Ah. <laughs> well, you guys did it. Oh, you want to stop recording? Oh, oh my goodness, I sure do. Thank you. Anyway, congratulations.